Hello friends, I welcome you all to this NPTEL online certification course on novel technologies for food processing and self life extension. I am Hari Nivas Misra, Professor of Food Technology at Indian Institute of Technology, Kharagpur. In this first lecture, I would like to give you a brief introduction of the course which will be followed by a brief discussion on constituents of food and its function. This course is a 12 week course having 60 lectures of 30 minutes each. There will be 12 assignments most probably one at the end of every week. There will be one online examination at the end of the course. The broad areas that will be covered in this course include food structure and changes occurring in food during processing, novel and emerging technologies for processing and value addition of food, food products manufacture preservation and self life extension of perishable foods and also towards the end of the course we will discuss about some selected ready to eat ready to cook health foods and beverages manufacturing technologies. The topics that will be covered in this course include in the week one, we will talk about introduction to food processing, preservation and quality, where we may discuss about the basic principles and methods of food preservation and processing, water activity versus food stability, how changes in the water activity and other factors influences the stability and quality of the food and also the relationship between structure and function of the food. In the second week, we will discuss about the changes that occur during processing of food. It may involve browning reactions both enzymatic and non-enzymatic. It may include protein interactions, carbohydrate interactions, rancidity and reversion and so on. This after giving a brief overview of the science aspects of the food, we will switch over to the processing technologies and where from the third week and onwards, we will take the processing technologies like high pressure processing, membrane technologies, irradiation, radio frequency and microwave heating, supercritical food extraction food extrusion technology for production of ready to eat snack foods. We might include here textured vegetable protein, rice and dal analogs. Then from the six, six weeks onwards, we will talk about hurdle technology concepts, natural antimicrobials, bacteriosins and freeze drying. Seventh week will include extraction and processing of oils including mechanical expression, solvent extraction, refining, hydrogenation and winterization. Also, we will discuss about the self life extension of oils using natural antioxidants. We will talk about concept of rancidity, measurement of rancidity and preparation of oil powder. In the week 9, we will take up the issues related to the self life extension of fruits and vegetables. Here we will discuss the novel technologies like modified atmosphere packaging, active packaging, edible coating and related processes for the extension of self life of high value perishable foods. This will be followed by the methods for 
control atmosphere storage of food grains. We may also talk about ozone treatment and microwave treatment for disinfestation of food grains as well as the methods for detection of spoilage of grains. In the last two weeks of the course that is weeks 11 and 12, we will talk about food fortification technology wherein we will discuss about pilot plant or pilot scale manufacturing technologies for ready to eat therapeutic foods, iron fortified rice, nutridol, fortified noodles and similar products. Functional foods and nutraceuticals, certain products like and technologies like manufacture of ready to eat pasta products, food powders, beverages, health foods or technologies like micro encapsulation, food nanotechnology etcetera shall be discussed in the course. Now, after having given a brief idea about the contents that will be covered in the course, I would like to give you a suggested list of the suggested readings that is the books which might be useful for this course. These are listed here that is a book on food chemistry revised and expanded edition by Owen R. Fenema, Modern Food Microbiology by James M. J., Mechanism of Action of Food Preservation Procedures by G. W. Gowell, Principles of Food Science Part 2, Physical Principles of Food Preservation, edited by M. Carl Owen R. Fenema and D. V. Lund. Another book which is useful in this subject is Food Processing Technologies, Principles and Practices by P. J. Fellows. Food Processing Principles and Applications by Stephen Kark and others. Next book is Food Processing and Preservation Techn Techniques that is by Peter Juthen and Leif Vag. Non-thermal preservation of foods written by Gustro V. Barabosa and others. And finally, the book on food product and process innovations in two volumes written by me will also be very useful for this subject. Well, friends, after having this a brief introduction of the course, now let us start the subject. And to start with, let us see or let us discuss what a food actually is. We are having this subject, technologies for food processing and self life extension. So, the very first question comes to our mind that what food is. So, as you could see in the slide that the food is a material that provides nourishment to our body. It can be defined as anything eaten or drunk which can be absorbed by the body to be used as an energy source, as a body building material or for the regulation of body processes. In nutshell, we can say that the food is raw material from which our body is made of. Every person is concerned about the food, but the aspect of concern differs with location as well as with regional and cultural variations. A person from 
south would like to have different interests as far as his food is concerned whereas the person from north east west they like to have their special considerations if you take the example of developed nations and developing nations in developing countries where majority of the population is involved in production of food but still the main issue there is how to feed the people how to provide adequate quantity of food to the masses on the other hand if you take the example of developed nations in those countries the scenario is just different there although less proportion of the population is involved in agriculture and food production yet they have plenty of food maybe in those countries the food is changed or processed or value added right so the main aspect of concern about the food in those countries or those regions of the world include how to give good quality food how to give health foods or the food which provide nutrition and health benefits the food is made up of a number of chemical components which are called nutrients these nutrients are required by the body in adequate amounts in order to grow reproduce and lead a normal healthy life major nutrients in food include water fat carbohydrates proteins minerals and vitamins over 40 essential nutrients are supplied by food which are used by the body to generate literally thousands of compound needed for the life these nutrients have specific roles or specific functions to perform in the body for example the main function of water is body building and repairing as well as regulating or protecting the body processes protein its main function is body building and repairing whereas additional function include energy giving regulating and protecting fats and carbohydrates are mainly consumed for energy purposes their main function is energy giving whereas body building and repairing becomes the additional function minerals main function is body building and repairing as well as regulating and protecting body processes vitamins main function is regulating and protecting body processes and additional function is body building and repairing <coughs> sorry the energy is the capacity to do work in case of food materials it is generally measured in calories or kilo calories or sometimes it is also expressed in kilojoule one gram of carbohydrate upon complete oxidation gives 4 kilo calorie energy equal amount of energy is given by protein as well however the one gram of fat gives 9 kilo calorie of energy the foods that we eat daily accordingly are classified on the basis of the nutrients they include as well as the functions which the nutrient perform in the body for example the foods which are rich in water protein and minerals are generally termed as body building foods whereas 
the foods rich in carbohydrates and fats are called energy yielding foods the foods rich in water mineral and vitamins such as fruits and vegetables are termed protective foods apart from this six major group of nutrients that food contain there are also certain minor components present in food and these minor components includes pigments and colorings flavorings enzymes and bioactives so now all these constituents that is the nutrients as well as these minor components of the food actually give a food its structure texture color flavor taste and nutritional value and here i would like to say that that it is not only the content of these constituent but also the manner in which these constituents interact in the food that actually decides the texture shape size color flavor and so on for example milk which on an average has around 14 to 16 percent total solids including fat sometime it may be as high as 18 to 20 percent or you can say in other words it has around approximately 14 to 16 percent solids and 86 to 84 percent or 84 to 86 percent of water and it is a liquid food on the other hand the fruits or vegetables like tomato cucumber which has around 95 to 98 percent water cucumber has as high as 98 percent water and it has only 2 percent solid in it but this is a solid food so you can see that is a food which is having around 14 to 16 percent solid like milk is liquid whereas a food which has only 2 percent solid is actually its shape is solid so it is the manner in which these chemical constituents interact with each other how they are present inside the food that decides actually the structure function and other attributes of the food so now let me give you a brief overview of also how the structure of a food influences its quality or what are relationship of structure to quality in food as i told you the characteristic properties of food affecting its quality are determined by both the chemical composition and the physical structure of food components the knowledge of chemical composition of a food is therefore a valuable tool in predicting the effects of processing and preparation on quality of the finished product foods are usually mixture of various substances in solid liquid or gaseous state these mixtures are dispersion systems containing dispersed phases and dispersion medium dispersion system may be classified according to the state of the matter like gas liquid or solid in each phase they may also be classified on the basis of the size of the dispersed particle as true solutions colloidal dispersions or suspensions there might be different types of dispersions depending upon the dispersed phase as well as continuous phase for example if the dispersed phase is gas continuous phase is liquid 
that dispersion may be a, a foam. Similarly, when the dispersed phase is liquid, continuous phase is gas, dispersion may be fog or aerosol. When both dispersed phase and continuous phase are liquid, dispersion may be an emulsion. When the dispersed phase is solid, continuous phase is gas, dispersion may be a smoke, it may be a powder. Finally, if the dispersed phase is solid and continuous phase is liquid, the dispersion may be a suspension or a sol. Another very, very important thing in the food is emulsions. That is emulsions may be present in two forms, either oil in water or water in oil. Here again, a milk is a good example. The fat which is present in the natural milk, it is an emulsion of oil in water. But when this fat is separated from the milk in the cream or then cream is further converted into butter, the phase changes. There it becomes an emulsion of water in oil. Small molecules or ions such as sugars and salts are usually dispersed in true solutions in food. Large molecules such as protein and cooked starch are colloidally dispersed. Large fat globules and uncooked starch granules form suspension. Various techniques and treatments which are given to food during processing and preparation such as heating, beating, homogenization or adding acid or any other treatment to which food come across during handling, processing, distribution etcetera may result or may change the degree of dispersion. And this change in the degree of dispersion may bring about different changes in the characteristics and properties of the finally food and that is what actually happens that is how the changes take place in the food properties during processing and handling. Dispersed particle may become more finely divided or may become more aggregated. Colloidal dispersions in food are generally stabilized by Brownian movement of the dispersed particle by like charges on the dispersed particles as well as by water of hydration around the particles. Colloidal substances may also stabilize other suspended hydrophobic particles by forming a hydrophobic coating on their surfaces. So, the surface phenomena play a very important role in the food dispersion systems. Surface active agents may be used to decrease surface or interfacial tensions by allowing the mixing of two immiscible liquids such as fat in water. A surface active agent acts as a bridge between fat and water because it has both hydrophilic polar and hydrophobic non-polar groups as part of its chemical structure. Water is an unique molecule and an important constituent of the food. It serves as dispersion medium in most food systems. It promotes ionization and it provides a medium for applying heat because of its relatively highly boiling point. HLB that is hydrophile lipophile balance value. It is a very, very important characteristics of a, a small molecule surfactant. HLB value of 7 means the substance is soluble both in oil and water. Substance which have lower HLB values 
are generally soluble in oil. Surfactants with HLB value more than 7 are used for oil in water emulsions, whereas surfactants with HLB less than 7 are used for water in oil emulsions. Now, having this a small background, a brief background about the science of the food, let us now switch over and discuss briefly about food processing. Food processing is a highly complex multidisciplinary activity involving the application of chemistry, biochemistry, biophysics, microbiology, mathematics and different branches of engineering. Today, consumer has increased concern regarding food safety and sensory qualities, which make us look for the minimally processed foods with least distortion to the profile of the food during processing. After the processing is complete, packaging, storage and distribution come into picture. Food processing ensures generation of traditional employment through forward and backward linkages. Employment mostly done in, in rural areas. Food processing also helps in reduction of wastages. It helps in increasing the farmer's income by getting better prices. It ensures consumer's welfare by increasing availability of food. I will just briefly like to give you an overview of the current and likely future trends in food processing. The food processing techniques are utilized to maintain quality, prevent spoilage and reduce the risk of food poisoning to a greater or lesser degree. The procedures themselves alter the characteristics of food products, sometimes in such a way as to generate completely novel food, but sometimes in the direction of quality reduction, particularly when compared with the fresh counterpart. Over the last few decades, therefore, the food processing research has been increasingly concerned with the development of improved means of technologies for minimizing this quality reduction while maintaining satisfactory capability and safety. A general and continuing trend is towards the development of processing technologies that are less severe and therefore less damaging to the product quality. There are trends towards more natural, less additive based preservation and foods that are nutritionally healthier that is they contain less salt, less sugar, less saturated fats, more polyunsaturated fats and have low calorie intake etcetera. And you will agree with me that most of these current and likely future trends have important implications for food preservations because many of them for example, less heat, less drying, less sugar, less acid, less use of additives unfortunately make effective preservation more difficult to attain. Reduction in the severity of some techniques has been successfully attained, but there is clearly much greater potential and given the current pressure and incentives, there is no doubt that improved techniques will be derived. But the rate at which the improvement occur will depend more and more on a sound understanding of the basis of the currently used techniques from which most of the new and improved means will be derived rather than on empiricism. In this slide, I just like to give you a, a general or generic flow diagram for a typical food process. In any food product manufacturing and preparation, we need there are certain ingredients and these ingredients might not be suitable for the farm or might not be of the farm in which they are to be processed. So, it might require certain preparation, primary processing are like cleaning, sorting, grading, peeling, slicing, etcetera, etcetera. After these ingredients are prepared, 
then they are scaled as per the formula and then most of the food processes might require or they require one mixing of one or the other kind. It may be mixing of solid to solid, solid into liquid, liquid into gas and so on. And after the mixing, they are processed. Sometime after processing, they are packaged as is the case of canning industry. And then after packaging, they are further subject to process treatment, then secondary packaging, utilizing and finally, storage. So, this is a generic step for a typical food process or food product manufacture. For the development of a food product, if you, want, you are interested, first you decide or identify the need or identify the opportunity, where does opportunity if required, some survey etcetera might be conducted. All right, and depending upon your engineering resources as well as your financial resources available with you, you develop the concept that is how you are going actually to meet that need. Or then this concept you test in your laboratory. If it is it passes the laboratory test, you can go for up staling or market production. And sometime it so happens that the concept passes in the laboratory, but when we go for the simply pilot scale or little large scale production, it fails because of the various constraints. Because in the laboratory, mostly we work on a comparatively smaller amount of the sample, we optimize the parameters on a smaller sample size. Then, when it goes to the bigger and the commercial scale productions, maybe that these processes etcetera are optimized conditions need to be adjusted. So, if that is market production is tested positive, you go for large scale production. Otherwise, if the, the market production if it fails, then again you need to go back develop or revise your concept or altogether develop a new concept and then finally, test it follow the same procedure, but make sure that the product its own should not or you should not spend too much time before in all this process. Otherwise, in today's era, we are living in a highly competitive world right? and you will, you will keep on testing and doing this and your some of the competitor will bring out a similar product in the market. So, one has to, you have to keep all these things. So, I think in this first class, I gave you a brief overview. Thank you all.